Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. In 2012, writer Matt Fraction headed up a creative team that gave us an instant classic. This was among Marvel's best runs with consistent tone, great character work, and emotional growth. Even though this was a second tier character who had been around for a long time. Hawkeye gave us only 22 issues across three years, but it was so influential that it's absolutely provided the basis for the characterization and the design of Hawkeye moving forward. It also seems to be the big inspiration for Disney's upcoming adaptation of Hawkeye into a Disney Plus streaming TV show. But it doesn't seem like that show is paying the creative team any extra. It's certainly not talking in any of the news articles I've seen about giving them extra credit. So I think it's definitely worth taking time this week to talk about why this run was so great. Let's give this whole creative team their due. And without any further ado, let's just get into it. Hawkeye has been a longtime member of the Avengers, but with one small exception of a period where he used Giant Man's powers, he's always been an average guy whose only ability is that he's great with a bow and arrow. Visually interesting, but realistically it's hard to justify putting him up against characters like Iron Man and Thor. But that's not important. He was always interesting because he was a bit of a dysfunctional jerk. He added tension to the team dynamics, beginning with his debut back in 1964 in the pages of Tales of Suspense number 57, where he was a misguided young carnival worker, jealous of the attention Iron Man got while saving lives at his carnival. He opted to dress up in a colorful outfit and was manipulated into attacking Iron Man, but he was soon granted an opportunity to redeem himself when Captain America added him to the Avengers in issue 16. Early Hawkeye was antagonistic towards Captain America, but quickly was won over and became a big supporter of Cap. Hawkeye would continue down a tumultuous path of short bouts of leadership, like with the West Coast Avengers and Thunderbolts, and screwing up his personal life, like with his divorce from fellow superhero Mockingbird. Marvel tried several times to give Hawkeye the spotlight, but none of his solo titles got much traction. All that history makes it all the more impressive that writer Matt Fraction, artist David Aha, colorist Matt Hollingsworth, and letterer Chris Heliopoulos finally cracked the code and delivered a take on Hawkeye that resonated with readers. It pulled in very respectable sales between 33 to 40,000 copies for its entire run, and its trades remain consistent bestsellers. So why did it connect so well? I'd argue it did what Marvel did best with superheroes. When Marvel superheroes launched in the early 1960s, writer Stan Lee worked hard to give its characters a life outside of being superheroes. Peter Parker's romantic troubles and money challenges were just as interesting as his adventures as Spider-Man. The Fantastic Four were cosmic adventures, but they were also a family with the inherent conflicts a family has. These character traits all helped make the characters more relatable. The title page of every issue of Hawkeye proclaimed its mission statement, leaning into this real-life stuff. Clint Barton, a.k.a. Hawkeye, became the greatest sharpshooter known to man. He then joined the Avengers. This is what he does when he's not being an Avenger. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. Okay, so I've wasted a few minutes of your time so far. What's important to know about Clint other than what you'll get in this story is that he's hot-headed, he's impetuous, and it leads him down some self-destructive paths. The first issue of Hawkeye begins with Clint falling from a building, with a voiceover text reading to us, This looks bad. Yeah, it does. And that's a recurring motif across the run. This looks bad. This looks bad. This looks bad. Clint gets hurt a lot. It's not uncommon to see Clint covered in bandages or even ending issues in a cast. He's very human, fallible, and vulnerable. And it's in that vulnerability that we can relate and see ourselves reflected. To act as a contrast and a foil to Clint, we have a co-lead, 
Hawkeye. Specifically, this is Kate Bishop, a young lady who took over the role of Hawkeye when Clint had died. He got better. That's just comics for you. But instead of Kate taking on a new identity, Clint takes her under his wing, and they have a platonic mentor-mentee relationship. Clint respects Kate's skills, which are impeccable. Kate works well as a co-lead because she's so different. Younger, female, she grew up rich. They both love archery and sarcasm, but Kate is much more organized and clear-headed. Clint, by contrast, grew up with carnies and is impulsive to the point that he sabotages his personal life. That includes his career, his health, even his love life. Clint battles depression. That's not something you see told in superhero comics too often. And when you do, it tends to be melodramatic stuff like Hulk screaming that he wants to be left alone. Kate has concerns about forging her own identity. These are realistic issues to tackle, perfectly suited for the everyman of superheroes. There's also an important supporting character that readers fell in love with right away. Clint gains a dog, who he learns was named Arrow, but who he renames Lucky the Pizza Dog. Lucky used to be owned by the recurring antagonists of the Hawkeye run, the Russian Mafia. But they treated Lucky badly, and the first issue ends with Lucky getting hit by a car. Clint insists that a vet go above and beyond to save Lucky. Clint can let himself down, but when he sees other broken creatures, he has a compulsion to help. It's part of what makes him likable in spite of his foibles. The other people Clint helps are the residents of his New York City apartment building. He buys it away from the Russian Mafia and spends his non-work hours with his neighbors, grilling or watching TV. It's an eclectic group of characters that you can't help but like and wish that they were your friends. They may have money troubles or mispronounce your name, but their hearts are in the right place. Mispronounced names? Yes. Hawkeye has a lot of recurring jokes, like how Gil, who grills, thinks Clint's superhero name is Hawk Guy. This book is funny, and that all comes from character work. Clint and Kate are sarcastic, they're quippy, but the rest of the characters in the book will bring up situational comedy. They'll bring up weird character work, uh, so it's not all setup and punchline type jokes. And the antagonists can be very funny. The Russian Mafia, I have never seen an ongoing threat so perfectly balance menace with actual laughs, without one somehow undercutting the other. Bro. The Russians are a threat mostly in their numbers, able to overwhelm Hawkeye's impressive fighting skills. He underestimates them several times, and they're tenacious. They don't go away. They hold a grudge and they're replaceable. The organization and its drone-like members are the threat more than any individual, like a swarm of insects. But they're also pretty funny. They all say bro a lot. Get used to that. These tracksuit-wearing goons love saying bro, bro. That isn't a big joke, but it's funny because it isn't forced. It's just part of these characters, and that part does not fit in with everything else. While some issues give us small glimpses of supervillains, like Madame Mask, who becomes an antagonist for Kate, mostly we just get groups of henchmen hassling Clint and his neighbors. Later in the series, there is an assassin who simply wears mime makeup and calls himself the Clown, but he's very human. The stuff from Clint's Avengers life always stands out as absurd. Like the time S.H.I.E.L.D. needs his help and abducts him from a grilling session with his neighbors, from the floating helicarrier. It's so over the top that it's ridiculous. It's completely incongruous with Clint's everyday life in most of the book. The story is very character-based, not plot. There's no overarching villain threat building or a MacGuffin to track down. Instead, it follows Clint as he tries to bond with his dog, his mentee, his neighbors, and to get over his mistakes. Because so much of this is character-based, the book is lucky to have artist David Aha at hand. He illustrates with bold, thick lines that are the opposite of the trend for hyper-rendered realism in most superhero books. 
But Eha's gesture work and character expression is flawless, telling, in as few lines as necessary, everything we need to know. He likes to divide his pages up into dozens of smaller panels so that we can follow emotional beats within the story. He plays with how comic book panels can extend or compress time, like in this moment where Clint's firing his bow and arrow while talking with Kate. But that's not to say that Aha can't handle action. The third issue features a car chase that has to rank among the best told in comics. It features an American muscle car, a wave of European Mini Coopers, and a spunky little Volkswagen Beetle racing through the congested streets of New York. There are dynamic establishing shots, there are ground-level scenes that give us a sense of scale and speed, and there are the money-shot images of car crashes. One moment I especially loved is this small scene where the Russian Mafia is about to be hit by Kate racing at them, unknown to the Russian driver. Even when the panels feature a bunch of action, characters are always central, and I mean that literally. We can look at pages with fight scenes, and there may be inset panels to show certain action beats, but the main characters are always central in the fights, as compared to big panels of fists or faces. AHA even does clever stuff with environmental objects to help frame the characters and draw our eye to them. There are a handful of issues with guest artists in this run. Uh, Javier Polito, uh, Steve Lieber, Annie Wu, uh, Francesco Francavia. These people all step in and keep the book running smoothly. They're all very competent. They fit the tone of that particular issue very well. But there's something that David Aha does. It's not just good panel-to-panel -panel storytelling. He develops iconography. Aha's artwork can often be minimalist, showing us just what's important. Some characters and a door, but not necessarily the whole room. Not every wrinkle in the clothing. But he can also use that minimalist approach to amazing effect with his eye-catching covers. Boiling down a character or a story to one image is not easy, and his work was obviously the template that parent company Disney took as, well, we'll kindly call it inspiration for their upcoming adaptation of Hawkeye for their Disney Plus streaming service. Just look at the Disney Plus poster next to the cover of the second trade paperback. On Twitter, fans noticed the similarities right away. Some said Marvel should credit the original artist. AHA himself let us know exactly where he stands on the issue, replying, even better, stop crediting, start paying, ha ha. The discussion of what a parent company owes the freelance creative team when they decide to adapt that original work into something else, that's a complex, deep issue that deserves its own episode, uh, deserves a lot of conversation. I'll just say that my opinion is, yeah, come on, Marvel pay the original Hawkeye creative team. There is no better example of Aha's command of iconography as a storytelling device than in issue 11. Told entirely from Lucky's point of view, this book gives us an entire story about a dog solving a murder. Instead of dialogue, we see symbols that show us how Lucky interprets his environment, smells and sounds, and what he associates them with. Backgrounds can become rendered as simple outlines because that's completely unimportant to Lucky. Dialogue from characters fades in and out as the only words Lucky would recognize are the ones that appear. It's a brilliant standalone issue that won several awards and simultaneously moved Clint and Kate's stories forward. The book does involve Clint's self-pity getting to such a point that Kate feels the need to head out on her own, having some adventures in L.A., but eventually, these friends do get reunited in time to help each other against their enemies. I don't want to overlook two other important members of the creative team that are there for the entire run. Uh, colorists and letterers are obviously always important, and sometimes you really only notice their work when it's done poorly, and when it's done well, it's just a component of the storytelling, and it's almost invisible. 
Um, and, and I guess you can always make that argument when things are done well. But I think in this case, Matt Hollingsworth and Chris Eliopoulos really do add something. They help elevate this title to another level. Matt Hollingsworth is widely recognized as a great colorist, and he makes some interesting choices in Hawkeye. Instead of overly rendered pages, Hollingsworth uses flat colors and focuses more on overall color schemes that are designed to help with tone. Within the same issue, you can have pages that are primarily yellow, indicating hot New York days, and then dark blues, showing us rainy environments. But they also match up with character emotions. When it's blue, Clint is depressed. Red represents anger and confusion. You can see stories go from realistic colors to a limited palette based around one main color, depending on what it's trying to convey. And the lettering from Eliopolis is great. He has a clever take on people's dialogue when Lucky hears people talking, as I mentioned earlier. Voiceover text boxes use upper and lowercase letters compared to the standard all uppercase text most comics use. It helps it stand out. And the fonts for special effects are fairly basic, like you'd see in silver or bronze age books, instead of anything too bold. This Hawkeye comic is gritty and grounded, and the fonts fit the tone. Ultimately, tone is very important to a good story, and Hawkeye is very consistent. It's about real-world problems. It's very gritty and grounded, but it's also very funny, and it can be heartbreaking. Sometimes a superhero gets a definitive run. I'm talking about when a creator takes over, is uninterrupted, and you get something like Frank Miller's Daredevil, or Walt Simonson's Thor. I'm sure you can think of half a dozen others. I would argue that Fraction and Aha's run on Hawkeye is right up there as a top-tier superhero story. I just think it hits everything on the head. It does it just beautifully. It's a modern Marvel masterpiece. Thanks so much for watching. I'm going to be back next week. Keep in mind, I always do a weekly show on my second channel, Pros and Cons. That's in the link. Uh, descript the link is in the description below, I should say. Uh, just sort of mumbling this stuff out of uh, free form. What else do I need to tell you? Uh, that's on uh, Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific. I always do a live show. Uh, I'll have weekly episodes that are fully edited here on Comic Tropes, if that's all you want. Uh, it definitely helps if you do things like comment, hit like, hit subscribe. That stuff all really helps the channel. If you want to help beyond that, there is always Patreon, but don't feel obligated if uh, you're not in a position. If you are, cool. I'm trying to make this work as my career, so taking steps towards that. Any help you can give is appreciated. But I'm going to be back next week. Uh, I really hope you check out Hawkeye if you haven't yet, specifically this run. I'll have a link for that in the description as well. And until I see you next time, keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.